So, uh, yeah, Swifty, take it away. What's, what's the sort of stuff you do? Uh, well, my, I don't suppose my fonts are the most commercially available. I sell them and distribute them myself. Uh, but I have been doing it for probably 20-odd years. And I was one of the first people to adopt the new technology and give it a go. Well, you, you started probably the first font foundry or something, didn't you? Back Not in really the first font foundry as such, but the first kind of independent right. font foundry in that... Yeah. I didn't design the font and then license it to Font Shop or Font Font or a similar company. I, I mm. went alone. But you come, from the design, it. you come from the design background and typography is something that's kind of cool. Yeah, I worked for Neville Brody. Yeah, left college, Manchester Poly, worked for Neville Brody. Mm -hmm. And that was in the very early days of, of you know, computers in general. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, it was early, early days. I've been there kind of since the beginning. Before that was very much a closed shop, you know, yeah. to get a font published, it was, it was hard work, you know. So, yeah, the technology has liberated graphic designers in general. Yep. You know, with the advent of, uh, you know, raster. Yes. Raster pr programmers and EPS files and all the rest, yeah. OK. Um, I believe you've got some, some little bits. VTs that we... Uh, are we able to take a look at those at all? Yes. So that's kind of, you know, a stencil font. Uh, and unlike a lot of stencil fonts that you can, you, can, you can buy or download for free, mine are true stencil fonts in that you design the font, you cut the stencil out, you spray it, then you, you, know, you EPS the file and then, and then so you make So it's still font. a very manual process. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You have to go through that process, and otherwise, to me, it's not a proper stencil font. OK. <laughs> okay. Um, this this um, little thing on, on the left is... Command Z, and that was my first foray into the font publishing world. Mm -hmm. And I was obviously inspired by the Fuse, um, experimental Fuse project that Neville Brody pioneered. And the idea was that, well, you, you got this little fanzine, little printed booked fanzine, uh, with two fonts, Miles Ahead and, and this one, which is still going strong today. I still sell this today, this is Dolce Vita. And you bought it on a floppy disk, 3.5 floppy. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone know <laughs> what that is? Takes me back, takes me back. Gunshot on, on the left, that was, um, you can see the sign behind, it's an actual metal sign that's been shot with a shotgun. A friend of mine in the south of France gave it me, you can't see it, but it says no hunting. And uh, the French in their militant manner like to do things like that. So it's actually <laughs> been shot by six, six uh, bore or 12 bore shotgun. Is this important for you, actually taking real life stuff and then creating... Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this, this manual process, rather than just sitting in front of a computer and feeling safe within your studio. I kind of do that as well. Yeah, I do that as well. I might just sit down and draw up a font straight away. Mm. Um, but to me, it's about the process that you have to go through, yeah, to make it real. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so, John, um, I... I a, a book that you are particularly well known for, and I've, I, I've seen it, it's incredible, it's the HTML and CSS book. Um, it's stunning. Why? What, why was it important to make this book as beautiful? Because obviously you must have put, as well as the content, an awful lot of effort into making it look how it looks. Um, I think a big part of the reason was I'd written about a dozen books on web design and programming, all of which looked incredibly dull. Right. They, you know, the people who are creating websites, they're creative people. To give them a, something that resembles a, a manual just doesn't seem fair. Um, you know, I, I wanted something I could give to clients who are struggling to understood, understand how to use a CMS. Some just made code a little bit more friendly. Um, so, yeah, we just tried to 
make it seem a bit more accessible. Okay, okay. Make the design more relevant to the people that are using it. And that's a really interesting point I th um, in terms of uh, actually fitting typography to the type of content that you're producing, given that your audience for that book is probably a very um, designery and technical community. It feels as though that, that's a good fit for, for your book and the work that you put into that book. Um, we, we did take time trying to, trying to pick which ones to use, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, typography. You've been in the business for a little while. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you swiftly. I mean, you've been going since the face in about 1986 or something. Yeah, that's when I moved to London, yeah. A little while ago. Yeah, so yeah. how has typography moved on over the last 20 years or so for you? Leaps and bounds, I mean... Um... I suppose, I mean, you know, for those of you who can rem remember letter set, you know, or... And then, and then typesetting, you'd have to send off to a typesetting house for mm. your typesetting to be typeset for you, and you'd have to mark it up, and... The, the whole process of, of artwork in type was, was laborious, and I suppose, you know, yeah, again, I'll, I'll use that word liberation, you know, graphic designers were liberated when Macintosh came along and, you know... The joy of being able to combine an image and typography on the screen, you know, I mean, that was just, that was just a joy to be able to do that, you know, I mean, at, at the time it seemed revolutionary and it still is revolutionary, we are still living that revolution, you know, because obviously the technology keeps moving on, uh, but you can never have enough fonts and you can never have enough choice, it's just a case of knowing what you're doing. I was, I was going to say, so given the other end of that journey from where we were 20 years ago to where we are today. Is today a happy place in terms of typography? I'd say it is, yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's issues. There are issues, like we were talking about, there's a sort of copyright issue, and it's not just a case now of, 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 a, of an end user, i.e. a graphic designer or a creator, buying a typeface from one of the distribution uh, houses or someone like me, for that matter, and then using it on a, a job that they're doing. It, it, we've got to think about the big picture now. Yeah. Well, given that we've been talking all day about the number of different <laughs> devices, you know, responsive web design and tablets, and phones, and huge screens and things as well, um, I'm interested in some of the the technical challenges, perhaps, about uh, you know uh, using the fonts that we now have access to on different devices. And I know that there are some specific ones when we start looking at consistency with mobile devices. Could you just talk us a little bit about about how fonts? Are challenges when when we're using them on mobile devices. Well, I think one of the things is that you've got the opportunity to use um, all these new typefaces that we didn't necessarily have the ability to use just a few years ago. Mm. Um, but you need to be aware, particularly with mobile devices, the amount of time which they can add to downloading a page. So while you're sitting in your studio, if you've got a good Wi-Fi connection, you're going to get the page displaying really quickly. Yep. But if you move to a rural location where you don't necessarily have a good signal, Downloading an extra few fonts can slow the page down. How, so, how, how big are we talking about here? How big, you know, a typical well, website font these days? Is it, you know, a couple of megs or a few K? Or what? It, it can be any, anything between 30 and, you know, 100K. But the thing is, if you just got... That's just for the one weight of the one typeface. So it's tempting to just add in some bold, add in some italic, add in another font mm. because you want to use it, and slowly it will add up. Right. Um, and you've also got to go and collect that off a different server. Right. So, or potentially collect it off a different server. So it's, it's just something to be aware of. You know, you've got all this choice. The other thing that is an interesting um, challenge is in the app area. Um, we're just starting to see the licensing for fonts, um, use of fonts in apps, starting to, 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 starting to make sense. Right. It, it's something which I think the type foundries are struggling with at the moment, and, and just seeing some hints of, of people making more practical solutions for that. OK, OK. So I, there's a certain sense of responsibility on the part of the designer to make sure that they aren't using 101 different variations of a font, that w whatever uh, their design on the site happens to be, that it is you know, usable across different platforms. Um, it's certainly, if you're developing a style guide, you've got to consider how it'll be used on different platforms. Um, and yes, the designer needs to be aware of, of that. But then analytics and the ability to look at how people are using a site really does help there. So okay, okay. they can be informed decisions. And I, I guess the other thing here, Swifty, is just because we can now use a rich palette 
if you like, of fonts on all of these different devices. The technology is there. Should we be doing that? You know, are there um, types of fonts uh, that, for example, work well on a, on a larger screen, but maybe don't render quite so well, have, have different usability issues on a smaller device? Is that something as a font creator sometimes you have to consider? I think the good typographic sense is essential no matter what, what you're designing. If you're designing a website, if you're designing a magazine, if you've got a good sense for typography and you like using typography, you're not going to use, you know, 20 different typefaces or fonts mm. on a magazine spread. So why why would you want to use 20 different typefaces for a website? You know, I mean, that, because the choice is out of there, it doesn't mean to say you have to use them all. You can still make a good website or a good magazine using two typefaces. You know what I mean? I think that's just good typographic sense, and that only comes from the person who's designing it, you know. I mean, if anything, there needs to be more stuff taught about good typography, really. Okay. People are still a bit confused about typography, you know, and, generally. And, and why is that? is that? Is that kind of poor education at college, or...? I, th I think it's getting better. I mean, even at <laughs> school levels now, they'll teach typography as part of their art courses and stuff. I think things are, uh, are improving, but I mean, I didn't, I didn't get taught about typography until I was sort of in my second or third year of college, you know, back right. in the day. Yeah, so I think, th you know, things are get. But there again, we were taught linotype and we were taught hot metal and, you know, the real traditional stuff. And I think that, I think there's, there's great, there's that book that came out recently, wasn't there? Just My Type, mm. that was a big hit. A lot of people read it. And, and, and people, I had people like, you know, my sort of father-in-law coming over to me saying, oh, I just read that book, Just My Type, you know. And he, and he listened to it on the radio and they, he, he loved it. He thought it was really, really informative stuff. I just think... More, yeah, more education. It's, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know if anyone saw it. There was an infographic that Adobe put out. I don't know. I saw it a couple of weeks ago. Maybe it had been out before. But it was the, the history of fonts going back several hundred years. Absolutely fascinating reading. I, I, I put it out on Twitter. Um, I'm interested in the work when, when you are creating fonts for clients, typefaces for clients. It's, it's the kind of process that goes into that, the kind of creative process as to how you assess a client's requirements and then translate that into the, into the type that you create for them. Can you share well, it's anything like about any other, It's like any other job, you know, you take the brief, you talk to the client, um, you know, you do a few roughs, you send them over, you get there by hook or crook. Right, OK. I mean, I had a client recently, in fact, a software company, who was a mate of mine, actually, and he, he came to me and said, I want a font, and I said, OK, what do you want? He said, I want it to look like the McLaren font. That's the brief. Right. Not that you rip off the McLaren font, but that, that's the brief. So it, it can come from all over the place. You know, there's, you can't, there's no rhyme or reason as to what, what job's going to come through the door next and what that person's going to want. You, know, you just have to go with the, the flow, really. Obviously, agency work as well. You get clients coming in to ask you to create uh, websites and uh, another media for them. What's the decision that you take as to whether you use in, the, in their branding and on their site an existing type or whether you go out to someone like Swifty or, or someone else and find, a, and find some custom type for them? Quite a lot of the, especially the larger companies I work for, will already have a style guide that they'd expect you to stick to. Right, OK. Um, uh, with the smaller companies or the, the ones that don't, that question's often to do with budget. Right and whether it's something that they feel excited about and something that they particularly want. But is it your job partially to educate your clients as well? You know, if you've got a strong feeling that for the, a design that you think will work for them, their, their typeface doesn't work. Yes. That can, be, <laughs> that can be an interesting discussion. You know, it's, this, it's the same kind of discussion as when you come across someone with a logo and you're horrified by it. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm always horrified by how many, how many logos are redesigned and they'll just use Helvetica. Mm. I'm horrified. <laughs> there are, I mean, OK, that, that, that's an important point. You mentioned... <laughs> <laughs> there are some classic... BBC, classic... eBay, I mean, you know, just shocking. I'm kind of disappointed that this slide back here is an Incomic Sans, frankly. <laughs> it's not Helvetica, though. It's, 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 it's one of Speakerman's, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but what, um, in terms of the place of these classic fonts, I mean, we all see Times New Roman, Helvetica, Ariel and, and, and Comic Sans, you know, and the, the kind of dozen or so fonts that are very common on desktop machines. Are they still important? Do they still have relevance to you? Should we still be seeing those out in media that we consume or should we be being a little bit more creative? It's 
whatever you, I mean, I, I'm sorry to, to, to diss um, Helvetica, of course, it's one of the most widely used fonts in the world and it's one of the most readable. I so that's why people. About it as well. Of course. So that's why people use it because you can read it at six point. Right. You can read it at, you know, five pixels. So it's adaptable computer. across different, different media. And it can look good big. I, I, personally, when it comes to logo types, <coughs> You need, you need a best poke font or you need... I'm a great believer in if, if you've got a logo, because I design logos, so if a company wants a logo, it's got to be best spoke. It's got to be created mm. for that company. You can't just take something off the shelf like Helvetica or Times Rover or any of those fonts and tweak it slightly and call it a logo. Yeah, yeah. You can't do that. That's sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a few people out there agreeing with you. John, do you agree? Uh, for logos, you know, it's great when, when you can get someone that, that will do that, yeah. I think one of, the, one of the tricky things which I've found is that there are a lot more clients that have opinions on what typeface they want to use and they will quite often come with an idea of yeah. what typeface they want to use. Irrespective of how usable or practical that might be? No, oh, yes. Right, okay. Irrespective <laughs> of anything, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they're the expert, clearly, and oh, they just course, employ yes, you yeah. to do the legwork. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, um, listen, that's a, a fascinating discussion. And it, uh, in a couple of other debates, we've discussed some larger topics, really. But it's really interesting to kind of roll up the sleeves and get stuck on to something that's actually quite specific in terms of typography. And there is so much material out there and there's so, so much to, to talk about. But we have run out of time here today. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, please, can you give a, a warm hand to John Duckett and Swifty? Thanks so much. Thanks,